and welcome to another edition of Managing Your Life's Changes. My name is Ronald Allen, and every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio, we have our guests and conversations all about managing life's changes. Today's guest, Hans Berserop, a legislator moderator from Denmark. He was born in 1947 and is the father of four children, now residing in Mexico, Canada, France, and of course, one always likes to stay close at home, one resides with him in Denmark. Hans' new book, Mediation, Six Days in Six Ways in Seven Days, demonstrates and illustrates the detailed differences and commonalities between six mainstreams of styles in mediation. Hans Bosserup is an experienced litigator and mediator admitted to the Danish Supreme Court, university lecturer, and teaches as a professor in three universities, Denmark, Sweden, and Spain. So he actually has four languages. With more than 3,500 litigations in his belt, he usually reaches and maintains a 90% settlement rate. Hans is a trainer of some 2,000 mediators in the art and science of conflict. Currently, he's working on a doctoral dissertation named Discourse Analysis of Rhetoric and Practice in a Variety of Styles and Models in Mediation. Good afternoon, Hans. How are you today? Well, it's great to be with you, Ronald. Thank you and welcome. Uh, many of our listeners will not know the challenge that we have faced in putting this interview together as I am calling into Denmark. It's now, and I believe our difference is six hours between each other. Is, is that correct, uh, Hans? That, that's right, yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So I'm going to ask you, Hans, a very open, broad question. What exactly is mediation? Well, um, the first time I heard about mediation 20 years ago, I thought it was, you know, <laughs> quite a specific thing. And uh, then I went to a lot of trainings uh, in different countries, and I found out that no mediation uh, uh, was like any other that I saw. And I started to wonder, is there a common description or a common definition to uh, mediation? And uh, I mean, one of the most skilled professors to look into that subject is an American uh, professor, uh, Leonard Riskin, uh, at University of Ohio. And even with his magnificent skills, you could not find uh, 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 an idea or a notion that encompasses all kind of mediations. And <clears throat> that was when I went into the deep of it and I came to think about whether the rationale, whether there was a different uh, ideology uh, behind what the different mediators did. And um, my research showed me that both the background and the experience of each mediator coming from a variety of backgrounds and uh, the way they communicate and the way they listen uh, seems to divide them into different groups. And, you know, uh, to be uh, a good teacher, you have to simplify all the complicated issues. And therefore, I tried to put them into six boxes. Um, and that is not fair. Whenever you simplify something, uh, you are not fair. But, you know, that is, that is a way that we uh, try to teach our students to uh, give them an outlook which is so simple that they can comprehend. And I ended up with these six uh, groups, and when I wrote the book, I, I, I actually uh, made the, the book uh, 
very different from other books that I'm written and other books that I'm read. So instead of having this theoretical uh, system that you normally uh, use when you write textbooks, I thought, well, what about if I imagine that I had my students for seven days, and in those seven days, I taught them seven or six different ways or styles or models in mediation. Very nice. Uh, so, so, so the question then has to be asked: Why is mediation so difficult? What is it? Is it an art? Is it a science? Is it a combination of skills? that makes it so complex and, and understanding that mediation of course can come from just the family nucleus of, of conflict in the workplace in the work environment certainly on the government level um, and as we are very clear mm -hmm. and, and hear all the time in the news on the global level where countries are, are vying for either labor or material positioning on a global basis. So can you, with those four or five categories, can you uh, give us some idea of some of the complexities that you have come across in, in your practice? Um, maybe there is a simpler explanation. Uh, and I learned about that when I started to train uh, pupils in school in mediation. Uh, while I normally use uh, more than 40 hours to train an adult mediator, I could train pupils in schools in just 12 to 14 hours. And when I observed or watched these uh, pupil mediators, peer mediators, as you call it, um, uh, mediating conflicts, I mean, they did it like in 12 to 15 minutes. So, my main answer to a question whether it is so complicated when it looks so simple is that we, as we grow up, um, pick up more and more obstacles. And that if you could, I mean, de-learn those obstacles, uh, <laughs> You know, it is almost like Christ said that if you could just be a child again, then you would comprehend much more. And of course, I, I don't think that 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 peer mediators, the pupil mediators, grasp all the um, the theory behind because they do not need to. I mean, it is simple for them. And then I thought about, well, is this a Western phenomenon? And I went across the world and I ended up in Afghanistan, um, which most of people will say is very contrast to a Western uh, comprehension. And I taught these um, uh, Hazara uh, girls from um, a high school and university in Kabul uh, to mediate uh, the way. Uh, children or peer mediators in school mediate and you know in two hours they grasp the whole thing and you know in Afghanistan the women are I mean they are below dogs <laughs> they have no rights at all and still I ask them do you think this will be useful for you at home I mean with all this power going around with all the men's deciding whatever is good to any of you, and said, yes, we believe so. Then I went to something else that was very West-inspired, and that was what we call active or effective listening. Uh, you can also call it uh, empathetic listening. And there's a big difference between um, the Westerners and the Asian people. Um, it seems like the Asian people um, uh, is much more cognitive when they uh, deal with conflict. Uh, and, and if you go 40 years back in, 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 in San Francisco, for instance, with the first 
mediation experiments there, and they added to the cognitive, the emotional experiences. And by doing that, they opened up for a vast array of data that was not prior uh, enabled to them. So when I came to Afghanistan, uh, and I also did that in, 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 in Tokyo and Japan, but I went to Afghanistan, I thought by myself, well, well, actual listening is something that these Afghan girls can appreciate. <laughs> you know, after another two hours, they say, well, this is a very wise way to solve a conflict. And many of them say, well, just when you do the active listening, a lot of new insights come up. And, and when you get new insights, you also get new perspective and you, and you uh, suddenly get new um, ideas how to solve the conflict. So the, the, these 11 uh, Afghan uh, female students told me, well, we just think that if we can be allowed to do active listening on people in conflict in our family, we think that just by that, a lot of conflict will be solved. Well, Hans, you, you, you've covered a good bit of uh, territory there, and I was pulling my notes out as you were talking. Let, let's, let's continue with the mediation in Afghanistan. You went in uh, 2007, I believe. That's right. And you worked with these students. I have some particular questions. If women have no rights, then who selected them for this very liberating experience? <coughs> who selected well, Who made that decision? Yeah. My, my daughter now lives in Canada, and she served uh, seven years in Kabul under Prince Charles of the uh, United Kingdom. And he had a program to build up again all the lost uh, skills of of traders, uh, calligraphs, masons, carpenters, and so on. She was a very bright girl, and she went to uh, one of the universities and asked who would be interested. And uh, these eleven Afghan uh, students turned up, and and it is it is not. I mean, it is important to know that these 11 girls that signed out, up was not pastors. They were not Tajiks. They were the lowest class of them all. They were Hazaras. Hazaras is uh, said to be uh, um, um, of the family of Genghis Khan when he uh, went into Afghanistan and plundered and pillaged and whatever. Mm -hmm. But these girls were very bright and and they were very brave. So, so, and that leads me right into my next question. So, what motivated these women to participate, knowing that not only do they not have civil rights as we know them in this country, and certainly women in this country, I believe it was in the 40s, that they were actually given uh, legislative rulings and, and the law to, to, to vote, etc. So, what motivated these women who were at the very bottom of the rung? As you mentioned, you've clearly distinct, uh, delineated the different social structure. What motivated them? What did What did they tell you? Um, uh, well, the first answer is that they would like to know whatever skill that could change their world. And from history, I imagine they knew that they could not believe in rights. So. I mean, if, if you go back to Greece and, and the Roman Empire, you know that there was a lot of slaves actually uh, uh, getting up in, in, in society, not because of rights, but because of their social and the negotiation skills. So I think that uh, these uh, uh, 11 Hazara Afghan students uh, found a way in mediation, in mediation, where they could um, address in within their families uh, issues that they could not address within the scope of rights. Absolutely, and and as we know, and we're talking certainly mediation at its broadest level. Most people are looking at 
I want something that you've either taken or I want to be compensated because you've done something to me. In this case, we're really talking about fundamental human rights and the ability to present your point of view to an adversary, basically, without falling into the same traps of being violent, um, which doesn't get your point across, which, which leads me to my next point, which is the media, as we know, pretty much controls images across the board, across the world. And you mention in your art, in your book that there were there there have been over thirty years of war where the media themselves didn't understand the implications that uh, mediation uh, could resolve. Can you speak to that? How how they you managed to use that to also pull the media or, we, we or make the media about aware? Again. Yes, yes. Okay, well, um, that daughter of mine, Hilda Christine, um, she's now married to the former Canadian ambassador to uh, Afghanistan. And that gave me an insight in uh, mediating uh, between the tribes and between the opponents inside the Afghan community. Um, and and, and with these uh, 11 female students, uh, they gave me an insight on what to deal with within their families and between the tribes. Um, one thing that is very different from a Western, Western point of view is that you cannot allow yourself in Afghanistan to lose face. And the expectation of two Afghan opponents meeting in a negotiation is that one of them will end up losing face. So you have to establish a very uh, particular uh, way of negotiation and mediation with each parties in different rooms. And uh, uh, well, in, in America and United Kingdom, you can call that to caucus. Um, um, whenever you caucus, the mediation will take much longer. And the reason it will take much longer is that uh, the opponents do not feel the dynamic of being in the same room. And that is something uh, that people from Asia may maybe understand better than Western people, because when you witness uh, something going on in a mediation room, you will sometimes know or feel that something is happening in the room and you cannot see it, you cannot hear it, you cannot feel it, but you can feel the consequences and the implication of that something is happening. And um, when you have the <clears throat> parties apart as it was necessary uh, in Afghanistan when, uh, when the uh, uh, United Nations mission there uh, tried to uh, mediate between opponents and uh, between uh, tribes and between warlords, uh, they were not able to get them into the same room um, and, and, and consequently, they were not able to draw on that very, very important dynamic that I was talking to you about. You, you bring up mindfulness mediation theory, and my notes on your book are, therefore, is mediation, and, and you've really touched on it because these are fighting entities that I don't think we even understand the intensity of their hate for one another and their ideologies. So could you address this point? Therefore, is mediation about realizing or recognizing what forces and emotions and leverage are separating the two entities just as much as it is about the prejudices or preferences of the individual mediator? It is 
very interesting. If you go up to Minneapolis, Minnesota, you will find a wise man called Mark Lombright, and he is probably the pioneer. Uh, well, the Mennonites were the pioneers, but then he followed up, and he's probably the most um, the most recognized pioneers when we are talking about victim offender mediation in severe crimes. And uh, he was one of the first to tell people that by experience of his, the shortest way between two opponents in a conflict, and he was talking about severe crime, the shortest way was to establish the way between the hearts. He, he called that the journey of the heart. And that is an empathetic process. You, um, you said it's the journey of the heart. Journey of the heart instead of journey of the head. Yes, yes. And, and what he was talking about actually was the difference between the empathetic uh, dialogue and the cognitive dialogue, the dialogue of the, uh, of the brain. And uh, when I observe uh, uh, mediation, uh, mostly in 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 United States and United Kingdom, it seems that there is a vast difference between what most of the lawyers do when they are trained in mediation. It is very very difficult for them to leave being in their head while the most effective way of mediating is to establish the journey of the heart. And um, when I have spoken to some of my uh, US and my UK colleagues about it, they have sometimes told me, well, we are embarrassed to deal with feelings. We don't think that our clients would like to deal in, with feelings, with feelings in 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 corporate cases uh, or in civil case cases, and when I ask them, do you think that a board of directors facing that their shareholders are going to sack them with the next general assembly, uh, are you telling me that they do not have fears, they do not have concerns, they don't have feelings, and are you telling me that the um, CEO of that company do not fear what the board of directors uh, will do when they think it is time to replace him. Is that not, not fear? Does that this uh, uh, CEO not have expenses on his house and his car and his family? And they say, well, you are right. Um, and, and, and all of us was trained in, in that, we call it pure mediation, not poor mediation, but pure mediation. But certainly, you cannot, with business people, adopt this model of pure mediation. And once in California, I witnessed uh, such, uh, uh, it was a, a, a conflict, uh, well, a young, a young boy, 11 years old, died on a summer camp and there was this conflict between the owner of the summer camp and the family and behind them the insurance company of uh, that summer camp and um, they mediated for 12 hours and in all of those 12 hours neither of the parties ever spoke a word it was just the lawyers speaking and of course, even if they have got into the soul and the body of their clients, they could not exactly know what was going on within their parties in, um, in, in emotionally. And uh, when they finished, and they actually after 12 hours found a solution, I asked them whether I could gather the parties one again and uh, do a mediation my way. And uh, they said, well, we have settled, so <laughs> they are all yours. And then we started once again. And I uh, started with this uh, style that we 
originally got from the United States 40 years ago, and it's called generic mediation, community mediation, pure mediation, but it is about uh, an empathetic dialogue. And this was without the lawyers. Well, the lawyers could easily have been present, but first time, well, for the first time, these parties uh, were talking to one another, and they were emotionally very much carried away because this was a big issue for them. Um, the family has lost their son, the cheated son, and the owner of the summer camp was about to go bankruptcy because of this accident and the bad press and so on. And with the less, within less than one hour, they found a solution. It was a different solution. <laughs> and you know, uh, it was, it was interesting to, uh, to tell the, 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 the lawyers that they agreed on a lot uh, or a much lesser sum. It was one third of what the lawyers has agreed. So losing someone cannot be compensated with money alone. And you have to get something more. And then again, I do not exactly know what happened within this mediation, but there was created a bond between uh, the, the teenage son uh, parent and this uh, summer camp owner. And, um, well, you know, as a mediator doing mediation in that way, you never try to explain. Most of lawyers would like to explain, explain, explain. Your only task is to uh, listen, to interpret, and to um, sometimes to um, to translate or to clarify what one party is saying to another party. Uh, because you, you know what you what you intend to speak is very rarely what the other parties actually hear. Absolutely. In fact, Hans, as you're talking, and and I obviously because of the the amount of information you're you're giving out, what I heard was that the camp owner probably always wanted to have a camp for kids to enjoy either because of his own well definitely because of his own personal desires and the feeling that it gave him and in connecting with the parents wanting to give their children the same experience then the hostility is reduced so let me ask you is there a difference between a mediator and a moderator in the profession well, as a uh, I studied that, and you can add the word conciliator as well. Um, and when you go uh, across the world, you will get a lot of names, and you will learn that what's in a name, as Shakespeare said. <laughs> and there is nothing in a name. Um, uh, the, the names are misguiding you. The only way you can really understand what is going on uh, uh, beneath the, 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 the name is to watch what is going on. So you have to look into the phenomenon instead of to the name. Absolutely. That's why I, I tried roughly to sort these uh, mediation that I've been studying around the world into six groups, and I know it's unfair. And, and, and my, next, um, my next mission is to uh, um, uh, uh, analyze the discourses of, of transcripts from a lot of uh, live medias, uh, videos on radiation. And I strongly believe that I can find a pattern. I have to ask this question. I may have asked it earlier. At the same time, to be very clear, is there such thing as a neutral party on the side of the mediator in such matters? And, and this and this plays to your point of mindfulness mediation. 
which you kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, but I want to make this a, a very specific question. Yes. Uh, I mean, if you go back to the um, uh, time of enlightenment, uh, when uh, when uh, the people of science suddenly got allowed to speak free, freely, uh, not uh, being controlled by the church, you would probably say that there was something like a neutral. Um, when you later on in the fifties went into what in uh, scientific circles is called uh, constructivism you know that the mediator is part of the system and that all the participants within the mediation room is a system. And you have this wonderful uh, uh, biologist from Chile, Matuana and Varela that um, uh, uh, studied uh, the, the pattern of uh, biological systems. And, and uh, then you and, and they say, well, a system is always trying to protect itself. A system is always closed unless it opens up. And it will only open up if it thinks it can get something that can contribute to its survival in a broader sense. And then you have this American in the 15th, Gregory Bateson, and he, trans he transformed those findings into um, uh, uh, social science and he found that it could explain a lot of things going on between human beings and that was probably one of the ways that constructivism was uh, uh, established. Then we have this other American, you have a lot of nice guys over there, um, uh, Bergen, um, ah, what was it? Perfect. And he invented uh, what we call the social uh, constructivist, uh, constructionists. And what he found um, was that um, whenever human beings communicate, the language is not a bearer of objective facts, but the language is actually creating the world. And there he draw on uh, an Austrian uh, philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, who invented, uh, together with the UK philosopher Austin, James Austin, what we now call a speech act. So when people inside the mediation room is doing something by words, uh, together or towards one another, they actually act. They are not only speaking, they are making acts. And um, coming back to your question, you, you, you suddenly realize that there's not such a thing as to be neutral. But you can have the ambition to be neutral. And then we have got these four wonderful psychiatrists in Milan, in Italy. And they were very uh, inspired by Varela and uh, Maturana from Chile. And they said, well, if this system theory is really holding up, then we have to turn anything upside down. So instead of uh, asking, what does uh, Mrs. Peroli needs to express herself so we understand her. And instead they ask the, the question, what do we need to understand Mrs. Perelli? And that, that was in the middle of the 60s. And that four psychiatrists, also called the Milan School, has changed all about communication when it is about therapy and when it is about mediation. And um, um, a, a, a UK uh, a man, uh, John Haynes, uh, moved to uh, US and he, um, he joined up with a Canadian uh, from Alberta called Larry Fong. And together they established a completely new 
um, uh, 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 what do you call it, paradigm of mediation. And that was not only cognitive, that was cognitive systemic. And the reason that they uh, adopted a cognitive way was that in family mediation, they have experienced that people, the parties very often got stuck in um, offended emotions. So they want to bring them from the past to the present to the future. And they wanted them to realize, well, you are here and think about your options. And we are ready to help you when you have clarified what your re really needs are. We are really to, um, to, uh, we, are, we are about to help you to negotiate. And the cognitive, well, the systemic thing was that they realized together with Dr. Bateson and, and Madonna and Varela, that each party to a conflict is by the beginning a closed system. So you have to get access to the system. And you cannot get access to the system without those parties thinking or believing that you or the process can contribute to something that will make their life better. So Hans, your, your point picks up on Carl Rogers' developed personal-centered therapy, the main yeah. inspiration to humanistic mediation, where he talks about when preparing yourself for the mediation at hand and when you are reach when you have reached complete awareness and relaxation, focus all the sounds around you, identify them one by one. He goes on to say, awareness of yourself is the ability to sense any part of your body, relaxed or tense, whenever you want to, and likewise to sense body processes as, for instance, the breathing. So, so not only are you saying be aware of yourself, of course the needs of, of the parties in the mediation and the, and the conflict, also be aware of your sense so that you're not giving off sensory communications. It's, th there's a wonderful book which I read in high school called uh, Fundamentals of Interpersonal Communication, and now I know why I read it, and that was for this interview. <laughs> um, it really does talk about being aware of ourselves so that as we're in discourse with different people, whether it is in a, in a, in a mediation environment, we're not giving off the wrong impression. You also mentioned that uh, there is a, a, a galvanizing, this whole theory with uh, John Hans, Larry Farmer, um, and the other practitioners in the field. It's almost as if they're going from a pedagogy system to an andragogy system and trying to realize a heutagogy where all parties are participating in the 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 mending, if you will, if I can use that term. And you even alluded to it regarding the camp situation. So I have a few other pointed questions, if I may. Um, we mentioned that. What are the competencies of a competent moderator? What are the, what are the competencies? And I know we're going to get to your six uh, points, which I actually have written down, and I have the website um, which I have put on my on my website, so people can just link into your six ways in six in seven days. Um, but could you just share with us your thoughts on what are what are the the competencies of a competent moderator? Um, in my experience, I I found that by the generic way of mediation, mediation. I could solve about 60% of my cases and when I adopted the other five styles, I could get up to about 90% uh, and there's a very important point to that, I could do that without sinning and when I'm talking about sins, it is to um, it is to influence the parties. Uh, I, I, I think that it is a true competence of a mediator never ever to influence the parties. They have a lot of powers, a lot of competences within themselves. 
And as you said with Carl Rogers, it is a matter how they discover them. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly agreeing with you that uh, going uh, through the five of our senses, it is important or it is possible not only to get a picture of the world which is much more shaded, but it's also possible to get a, a, a picture of yourself much more shaded. And what Carl Ronald said was, that, well, you are in this situation now, and you cannot change the world, but you can change the way you experience the world, and, and that will empower you if you can do that. So, uh, to die, today I will say that um, what I would um, um, what I will ask people if they want to get really um, uh, competent leaders is to look into these uh, four, uh, six or more different styles and whenever they are together with parties, they should test which of those six routes um, would be most efficient to the parties and uh, the parties um, are different, at least in a way that they communicate differently and they think differently. And if you can adapt or if you can adjust to their way of communicating and to their way of thinking and to the way they see the world, it is much more likely that you can get them um, into common ground and first they can find understanding and next they can find an agreement. This is Managing Life Changes and we have Hans Berserup, a litigator, mediator from Denmark on the line, and his new book, Mediation Six Ways in Seven Days. Please go to our website, ronaldmallon.com, go to the blog, and you'll see the link directly to his seven-day program six ways in seven days video training material which I have looked at is which is very effective and also you'll find a number of other mediation and health information introductory material and so let's go into our second part of the program Hans let's actually talk about each of those uh, six days seven days seven modules Let, let's start off you, you've got professional disputes and court annexed mediation just a kind of a, a somewhat brief summary but make it as comprehensive as you need it to be yes well it is it is not the um, it is not the scenery of the conflict it is not the character of the conflict it is not the nature of the conflict that um, make you pick a certain style in mediation and um, conflict is between peoples within organizations, between countries, between whatever, they are made of the same stuff and they do exactly the same to the parties. And, 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 and therefore, when you carefully listen to the way that the uh, parties communicate, you will know very much of which style to adopt between these particular parties. Um, and also, when you uh, get a, a, an image of their way of thinking or their way of seeing the world, you will know that some styles of mediation will not be efficient and some you should go to trust. And if you, for instance, uh, take the original or the generic uh, mediation style from the United States 40 years ago, um, it is advisable that <clears throat> you use that in, in the beginning. In, in well, I, I dare say, in any case. And um, that is empathetic, and all parties love to be listened to in an empathetic way. Then, um, by 
analyzing uh, the, 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 the way of communication and the, the way people uh, see the world, you will know whether this is about a crisis or a breakdown in communication. Um, and if you realize that that is the case, then you try to optimize their um, communication. That is what um, uh, 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 Bush and Folger uh, told in their uh, important book of uh, 95, The Promise of Mediation. If you think that these people are very antagonistic or hegemonious against one another, I mean, either they cannot understand at all what the other part is saying or meaning, or they present to do. So they are not giving anyone any kind of recognition. Then you know that you have to move the process up to the head. And you have to um, ask uh, the parties, well, I, I have the feeling that you are speaking in different contexts, and that is all right. Could we make a choice? Could we clarify uh, which context each of you um, are speaking in? And it is your choice which context we should deal with, but I can promise you that we will deal with all the contexts. But but are they but are they are the in the context of professional disputes court annex mediation is it ruled or governed by rules and legislation through court appointed entities? No, okay. and thank God. Um, in, in 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 Finland they have tried to do so. In Florida, I mean, in Florida that is a state under in the world where they have most regulations uh, in mediation, and I can tell you why. Well, my guess is that in, Fr in Florida, mediation is reserved for lawyers. And what does lawyers love? Rules, regulation, control. Mediation is about taking control away from anybody but the parties, to give the parties the control. Uh, I, I, I know a lot of wonderful uh, mediators in Florida, but they are written by this tradition. And it is really a shame that they do not allow other professions or people without a profession into mediation. Mediation can be a lay skill. You don't have to be professionalized at all. It just takes some basic training and, and, and some will I mean some will get it and most of them will get it and some will never get it. But coordinate mediation, professional mediation, mediation corporate cases, mediation within uh, 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 corporate organizations, mediation in employment cases. They are not different from any other country that you can get to see in mediation. Empowerment and recognition. That's your your second day um, activities. What 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 does that encompass? Well, forty years ago, um, um, they, the the people in Atlanta and San Francisco and uh, New York. Uh, and I think Indiana, they were thinking in a way that empowered people. They have just not found the word. They were thinking about something that they called common ground, meaning looking into the other party's world. And um, as 10 years after, I mean, 30 years ago, lawyers and businessmen um, found that mediation in, in the United States uh, was an excellent idea and, and, and was very efficient and uh, 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 met a lot of their needs. So they took it in, but unfortunately they colonized it. So instead of having, uh, well, I get further. And then in 94, 
um, uh, Bush and Joe Folger uh, uh, wrote this wonderful book of the promise of mediation and they reinvented and they named uh, the two important phenomenons, phenomena, uh, empowerment and recognition, and made it very, very clear that a lot of uh, mediation in the United States has actually lost those components. So they, they look back and say, what was mediation about in the first place 10 years ago? And they say, well, there were three equal aims. Um, and one of them was understanding slash agreement. One of them was empowerment. And one of them was recognition. And so they, they put names to these very, very important phenomena. And I mean, if you go into a, a, a professional or a, a lawyer mediator or judge mediator in, in the United States, and ask them, do you know about empowerment and recognition? They will hopefully say, yes, we do. But we think that our clients much more would like to concentrate on what are their risks if they are going to try. And that is what uh, uh, the mediation slang is calling the settlement-driven mediation. So in, in my book, I name settlement during mediation for those mediation that know very well that empowerment and recognition um, are important, but they are not doing anything actively to bring empowerment and recognition about. I see. Victim-sensitive offenders dialogue in crimes of severe violence. What would we learn in this stanza, in this day's activities. Yes. Uh, then you had to go uh, first to the Mennonites um, in, in, in Ontario and in uh, Indiana, I think. Um, and um, um, 30 years ago, maybe more, uh, there were uh, two boys coming home from uh, a late evening and they were drunk and they uh, spoiled a lot of property on their way home. Actually, they spoiled property of, I think, 23 homes. And they were arrested and they were brought to court. And um, uh, uh, their probate officer, a Mennonite called Mark Yancey, uh, he asked the judge, judge, can I get three months to make these two youngsters repair what they have harmed. And <laughs> they just were silent for a while. And then I said, well, I cannot in the law book find any rules to grant this to you. And then Mark Gansy told him, can you find anything against me? <laughs> and Mark Gansy was very, uh, 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 well, he, he was very, a uh, man of, of very uh, high uh, esteem and actually uh, the judge gave him the three months. Then uh, he started the first victim offender mediation and that was not at all victim offender mediation. But he took this guys, two guys, and he left them on the gate to eat of these 23 prop three properties and they went in and they pressed the button and when the door opened they started to say we are those guys that um, that spoiled your property and we do want to apologize and we do want to restore what we did wrong and most of these 23 uh, uh, homeowners engaged in dialogue with them and uh, they, I mean they were surprised they never seen anything like that before and three months later when their boys and their parole officer uh, turned out in court again um, they um, told the judges that they have repaired they have restored um, uh, most of, of, of the destroyed properties 
and they have got uh, a declaration from all the 23 property owners that they, those 23 uh, individuals, would like to recommend a suspension and um, imprisonment. And these guys, I mean, in the normal system, they would have been sentenced to, well, at least three months in jail. And now they got three months in jail suspended. And uh, Mark Yancy, young Yancy, to this took this experience into um, into uh, the Mennonite community, and uh, in 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 Akron, in Pennsylvania, you have this uh, Mennonite uh, center for conflict resolution, and they are sending people out in the world in the most risky places, and they lose people every year because the Mennonites will be the last to leave a risky spot. They are staying as long as their task takes them. Well, now up in, um, in uh, Minnesota and Minneapolis was uh, Mark Umbra. I'm not sure that he is Mennonite, but I think that he uh, shared faith with them. And he thought by himself, um, and he was inspired by a photographer in uh, the Mennonite community um, writing a book of, of I mean, um, what victim and um, offenders have done to each other's life. And those two came to think about, is this about law? And they said, it is not. It is about two people uh, having entwined in each other's life. And even if you get, if you give the victim hundred of hours of, of psychotherapy, you cannot get these two entwined lives from each other again. It will take something more. And they came to think about Carl Rogers, and they thought uh, about mediation, and they thought, well, is it possible to combine them, to take out any control, to leave the victim and the offender on their own, face to face, uh, in a dialogue, so they can talk to one another about how they have um, uh, interfered with each other's life. And uh, um, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the United States, you incarcerate a lot of people. You incarcerate, I think, well, <laughs> if we, uh, I mean, if you incarcerate 100%, we incarcerate 10%. I mean, you, are, you and Russia are the two countries incarcerating. <laughs> well, all, well, very much, very many persons. And that was, so they had to go into the prison system. And the prison system was very strongly opposed to let the victim meet the offender because all the legal system, the legal penal system, think that what you should do is separate the victim from the offender. And thinking that separating the victim from the offender will give the, will give the victim peace. But it doesn't, because the offender is inside them. Their life has come together, and uh, um, and, 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 and and finally they uh, they managed to uh, start uh, uh, mediation in severe cases. Um, uh, Thirty year, years ago, we we had uh, 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 subsequently of, of, of the uh, experiences from Ontario and Indiana. Elkhart, Indiana, and yes, and, and Kitchener, Ontario. Those were the two towns, and um, a lot of a lot of mediation services has taken up mediation in in in, in thefts. I mean, in shoplifting and light cases of theft, light cases of violence, light cases of destroying property, but only. Um, Mark Umbright 
and his um, colleagues um, uh, took mediation into severe crime. And they have done amazingly. Um, every year when we attended uh, Victim Offender Mediation Association's General Assembly, there would be a victim of severe crime or the, the family of, of the late um, and killed victim to talk to us about the impact of meeting the offender. And it is very, very difficult to explain what is going on in that kind of mediation. And I, I, I know that, I mean, in, in my country, in this part of the world where we it seems to be rather tolerant, it is extremely difficult to tell people, and, and I think that more than 80% cannot believe what is going on in a mediation of severe violence. And I think the percentage in your country will be less than 5%. So it is really upstream. But if you give a voice to the victims, they will tell you that what they experience, um, well, it is very close that they say what they experienced was to be touched by God. Uh, something happened in their life, something about respect, something about understanding, something about reducing anxiety, fear, something empowering to take action in their own life. But I, my experience is you cannot, I mean, you cannot, you cannot explain this. You can only, I mean, ask a, a victim of offender mediation in, in, in severe cases whether you can attend. And, and you will know that both the offender and the victim will have nothing against you attending, as long as you are not a whole audience. And then if you get that chance, and, and, and all the politicians in the American Senate and the House of Representatives should get that experience, and they will know that they have something in front of them that is so powerful that it should be included in their own process in the upper and the lower house of your parliament. So Hans, then that, uh, I know we're running out of time here, but I want to get two more points. One is system thinking, one is microdynamics, which is really what you're alluding to. And then thirdly, the, the, the mediators that you have trained, what are the common threads among the different nationalities and then across nationality. So if we can come back, the first question which leads from what you've just discussed, system thinking. What can you tell us and share with us about your observations about system thinking? Well, there is, I mean, if you have, if you have all people from one year, born in one year, uh, then about 15 to 20 percent of them will not be able to benefit from an empathetic process. So you have to move the mediation from being a journey of the heart to the journey of the head. You have to make it logical. You have to make it a brainy process. And that is about clarification, that is about choice, and that is about negotiate. So that's that a, that, that's a, that's a, a 180-degree change on the initial mindfulness mediation. Definitely. Okay. And, and, you know, well, some people, a lot of people um, benefit from cognitive systemic mediation. I, I can say my personal experience uh, is that I use it when I am together with parties that cannot benefit from uh, empathetic process. Microdynamics.
share yes. with us. This is a big area, and it's really not fair because we only have a few moments. But but tell us. It, it may not be that big. Um, I mean, when you were planning this program, you may think about what can mediation do to community, what can it do to the parties, and so forth. Can it lessen the workload of the court, and so on. We call that, and, and you, you dealt with uh, neutrality and non-partiality. That is what we call uh, the macro dynamics. You also started this program by welcoming it, and you put an icebreaker into it, and that is micro dynamics. If you appear in court and you see that the judge is not having eye contact with you, that is a micro dynamic, a negative one. You may uh, uh, speak to someone where you, you, you feel that you have a genuine contact with, between the faces, that is a micro dynamic. Okay, very. I, I love the way that as large as these discussions could be, and as complicated as perhaps other people need it to be, you know, and it's funny, Hans, in some of my consulting work, people will say, well, I need it to flow in such and such an order, and I will respond by saying, well, will you consider and to see their response from that point of view. So you, you have now taught me uh, a, a lesson that I use with consulting services. So thank you. I, uh, uh, my check is in the mail to you. <laughs> it, it was wonderful to be with you, Ronald. Um, so just to, to just to finish up, Hans, again, this is Managing Life Changes. We're speaking with Hans Berserup. He's a, a litigator. Excuse me. He's a litigator, <laughs> moderator from Denmark. We're speaking to him in his homeland in Denmark. He is an experienced litigator with over 20 years, 3,500 litigations under his belt, a 90% settlement rate. He's on the Danish Supreme Court, and he's speaking to us from his home. And Hans, just as a wrap-up, um, cultural differences, and that's because I always look at it from nationalities as opposed to a color factor, which unfortunately that's the perspective in America, primarily perspective in America. Nationality-wise, what are the similarities you've seen in training those 2,000 plus mediators that you've worked with, and then what are some of the common threads across nationalities that you've, that you've recognized? Well, if I compare the girls from Afghanistan to the people I met in US and Canada, to the people I met in South Africa, to the people I have met in India, to the people I met in, in Argentina, they are all the same when it comes to conflict. Because conflict is deeply touching their life. And there are differences, there are cultural differences when we are talking about adults, when we are talking about pupils of the school, peer mediators. You will, well, at least up to 14, 15 years of age, you will find, you don't believe it, you will find no difference at all. Well, Hans Brusserup, thank you very much for your time. Uh, please go to our website, ronaldmallon.com, go to the blog. We will have his interview for you in within literally two hours on our 23 different social media sites. We do have our link directly to his uh, uh, book where you can purchase his book. You can come to his site, Six Ways in Seven Days, which will be available, and you'll be able to walk through his uh, video tutorials day one through seven. Hans, thank you very much, sir. Have a good evening. Take care, Alan.